we've set aside a, a space and called it an art gallery, so therefore there must be a definition of art. Now, when you hear people, when I hear people say, "Oh, anything can be art," it's, like, well, it's patently not true, is it? Because if everything is art, we don't need the classification of art. It's just stuff like everything else. So the fact that we've got an art gallery means someone somewhere has decided this qualifies as art, this does not. And when I go into an art gallery, I want to be moved in a certain way. Did, did the work take a great deal of skill that I don't possess? Because that will impress me. Did it take a long time to complete? Again, that would impress me. Uh, is it beautiful to look at? Etc, etc. Does it move me? Does it tell a story? They have to tick these various boxes and then it's, it's art. If, they all, if they're all ticked, it's a masterpiece. Like um, Dali, St. John of the Cross, where he, he decided to paint it from this really unusual angle, you know, from above, uh, and the lighting was so dramatic, and everything about it is a masterpiece. I appreciate that the art world has moved into sort of the conceptual arena, where the idea becomes dominant. So you get the sheet at the side of the work that you have to read and study. That's irrelevant. You shouldn't have to read that. You should just appreciate the work as it is, without any explanation, because that's how it was intended. Uh, it, it finished with Piero Manzoni's Cans of Artist Shit. You couldn't... That was it. That was the best joke you could possibly do with conceptual art. And then I went to um, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park to have a wander around there, and there were these sculptures where there were kind of legs married with a suitcase or something. And I'm thinking, well, I understand how ideas come about. You take two disparate ideas, put them together, and you've got an original idea. But then you have to kind of disguise it in a way that it becomes interesting or it's not obvious that that's what you've done. But the problem with the Yorkshire Sculpture Park exhibits was that it was so apparent, someone had thought, well, what's, what two things don't really go together? A pair of legs, a human legs, and uh, a suitcase or a briefcase. I'll put them together. Hey, presto, there's original art. The criticism I have of the art world today is that it has run out of ideas. It does not know where to go. And part of that problem is that the, the people who run the art world now are purely commercial people. It's about investment. It's about money. Make the artwork, in inverted commas, an investment so people will continue to buy it, etc, etc. How do you respond to that, Tony? <laughs> Starting, I suppose, the last thing and going backwards, um, the art world, as far as I'm aware, going back centuries, has always been about patronage. Whether we like it or not, it's always been the people with money that are, are the arbiters of taste whether it is you know, the big collectors nowadays, whether it's the big galleries, going back whether it's the Michis, whether it's the kings, whether it's the princes, queens, royalty, or the rich merchants, it's always been about that. So it's no great difference now to say the art world is purely driven by money. It kind of always has the Sculpture Park exhibition, so that's a, a, a worm. Um, so he's an Australian sculptor. I did a bit of reading before I came just to find out why he does what he does. I thought sometimes, actually, researching something and reading about it gives you a way in. It's a bit like trying to enjoy cricket without knowing the rules. If you don't know the rules of cricket, you're watching this game going, I've got no idea what's happening. He always likes the, the everyday object and how you can treat the FJ object, whether it can be a humorous object, whether you can place it with different ones to have a different context. So basically, he's playing with the everyday. I'm not a fan of his work, although I do like the, the car that's going around a corner that's all kind of warped. It's a very clever piece of uh, workmanship and looking by, back at your definition of art, did you go into the gallery and see the car that's slightly warped as if it's going round a corner? I don't think I did. It's a really good picture, and it must have taken, I mean, it looks like a cartoon of a car, but it's a real car. He's taken a car, refabricated the windows and everything, so it's all in a slight wobble. So that, by your definition of art, it looks great, must have taken an awful long time. There's no way I could do it. Um, so he purely is, he's a crass person in the ability to do that. Why do it? It looks great. So it kind of, and it moved me because it, 
It reminded me of my childhood watching cartoons and there someone made my cartoon childhood real life. So that one moved me. The giant pickle outside, I remember, doesn't. But it moved my 70-year-old daughter who found it very funny because it's slightly phallic. You know, an artist is allowed to make work that you might like or you might not like. We can go to the sculpture park and it is affordable. Look, the, the tickets are going up, but it is affordable. But it's only affordable because it's subsidised. Who is subsidising it? Uh, we are. So we subsidise through our tax, we subsidise the Arts Council, the Arts Council then subsidise the galleries. Right, so my next point is, mm. who are the arbiters of what is acceptable to be exhibited and what is considered not art? Because you've said it's subsidised by us, mm. that's the general public, mm. so you would think you would get a representative of the general public sitting on the panel going... I like representative art. That's what I want, and that's what I consider to be. This is purely mm. hypothetical, but mm. you know that could be a thing. And yet, I'm not aware. I could be wrong that there's anybody on these panels who would say, you know, from my point of, from my mm. uneducated point of view, because I don't want to study mm. all these textbooks about what mm. the artists think, etc. I just want to see stuff that I like. Most publicly funded bodies have a, a board of trustees that are the general public that are elected onto that board. So they have the over, overview of what any gallery will put on. The curators only act on the instructions of the board of trustees. A lot of people that I speak with who are educated, cultured people have throw up their arms when it comes to art. They're, they're with me. It's like it's run out of ideas. It's nowhere to go. Because of the advent of photography and now AI, etc., it's, it's like, well, it's pointless having this category of art. It's a legacy from the past and there's no point in it. So you don't think that any modern art from, say, the 1890s or 1880s onwards has any value whatsoever? When I see some abstract paintings where the colour scheme is that exquisite then it ticks the box of that is aesthetically mm. beautiful. Mm. So it still ticks boxes. Now with AI, uh, I remember seeing um, a sculpture of some uh, black woman who was protesting or something. And this, this black artist decided to make a sculpture of her. And there was a picture of the sculpture. And I thought, wait a minute, this is the, the detail and that is incredible. And it looked like it was just several days after the protest. I thought, how could he produce something so quickly that is so detailed? Anyway, a friend of mine said, oh, it's, it's all laser. You know, she stands in front of uh, some lasers. They scan her, blah, it's all fed into a computer. Then it's spat out as some kind of 3D. There you go. There's your art. And I thought, is that, that's not art. That is mass production. That's making cars or whatever. So that this is where it gets really awkward now. What is art and what is not art, Tony? Okay. Art is created when an individual experiences emotions and wants to transfer that emotion to someone else through some creative medium. That's my definition of art. I mean, you've been arguing that it's now just a commercial enterprise. No, no. Uh, the art is generated by an artist wanting to do that. The fact that somebody pays it is another thing entirely. Uh, the art market is different from creating art. But we've got this problem where you're an artist, you have an idea, but it needs funding. You need patronage. So you approach whoever is the, the patron and say, I've got this idea. And they go, can I sell that? Is that, you know, would that be blah, blah, blah? And that's their consideration. So... Whatever feelings you had, the emotions that you experienced and you want to convert into this, is like, nah, mate, we, you know. My return on investment, say you're Michelangelo, so I want to do this sculpture hmm. from marble. It's going to take me four years to, or, you know, <laughs> Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Hmm. It's going to take me 20 years to paint that. Hmm. Not interested, mate, hmm. because we want a return on investment. So you don't get any exhibited. Hmm. Whereas the, the artist mm. who says, I've got this, I'm, I'm moved by money, Damien Hurst, right? Um, that, by the way, that is, I'm not being sarcastic. He's a very clever, blo he knows exactly what he's doing, but he's motivated by money. So he's like, approaches a bit, I've got this idea, very easy to put together. 
I can subcontract all the things. You know, it's a shark in formaldehyde. Uh, you just make a fortune. Great, we'll have that. So now you, you've you've always got this arbiter of taste, haven't you? That isn't really anything to do with the public. It's just foisted on the public, and it and we're told it's art, whereas in fact it isn't. It's a commercial. It's capitalism doing its thing. That's what it, so when you go to an art gallery, it's capitalism. And we've already agreed that the patronage of the arts in the was kind of based on, but at least the artist then had a license to get, oh, I can make this mm. beautiful. I want, you know, my career. So I want to impress people with X, X, X. Whereas now it's a case of let's turn it over as fast as we can. Uh, and in fact, let's use the technology that we have, mm. the AI, the scans, the, and there it is. Hmm. I mean, the, the, I can always imagine a, um, a stage where you don't even have the artist. It's just AI. Hmm. You tell AI, come up with art. There you go. So, I mean, the same thing is like, I'm just noticing there's guitars in the corner there. So you write songs. Why do you bother if it's all run by business? And by, you know the music industry is a capitalist industry. Yes. Why do you write songs? Because I get pleasure from it. That's it, because when you mentioned the start of that sentence, you talked about me, I create art and I only do it because I need to find someone to buy it. It's never happened. I've never had an idea and had to sell it. I've had an idea and done it. So the world we're talking about, the one that gets you very angry, shouldn't affect us. It should not stop us from making art just because capitalists rule the roost. That should not stop us from creating art. That should not stop us from having original thoughts. We must not let ourselves be beaten in submission by capitalism. So I want you to continue to make music regardless of whether anybody will hear it because that's not why you do it. That's not why I make art. Uh, people may never see it. I don't do it for people to see it. Um, occasionally, as you see, I do have exhibitions because I quite like people going, oh, what are you up to, Tony? I've been up to this. And they come and have a look and some people like it, some people don't. But I've made no money out of any exhibition I've ever done. I've sold one piece, and that's only because someone said, please, can I buy a piece? So I don't do it for money. And art shouldn't be about money. And just because we know it's part of a system that's ruled by it, it should not stop us from making art. Do you know, I think that is an incredibly important point you've made. Um, if we could separate art from capitalism, you know, I mean, you start getting into the politics of uh, universal basic income. So the pe people who are creative just think, I want to make these things. Hmm. Um, then that would revolutionize the whole thing. Uh, because, I, you know, when I write a song, hmm. it's just I get a vibe from it. I know very few people are going to hear it. Hmm. And I'm never going to make a great deal of money from it or any money at all, probably. But... You know, when I get into a groove with it, it's like, well, I enjoy that. Hmm. But I, I spoke to a friend of mine, a late friend of mine, uh, who's a photographer. He often asked me, if, if you knew that no one was going to hear what you or see what you created, would you continue to create it? And I said, probably. And he said, I wouldn't. The, the whole point of photographing things is to share. Yeah, that was yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, luckily, um, whether we like it or not, Technology allows us to do it. Uh, going back to just the music, 30 years ago, if you wanted to record a song, you'd have to book a studio. Technology has allowed you to go, I've got a drummer here, I've got all the things here, I can do it. We have social media, you can release it that day and can be seen by hundreds and hundreds of people without any money changing hands. Um, so I, I like this technology. I like the fact that I could get an iPad, do a drawing, press send, it appears on Facebook and people go, I like that or I don't like that. And it completely bypasses this artistic world that I think we both struggle with, um, but we're aware that it exists. Now, if in, a, in an ideal world, if a record label came to you and said, really like your songs, really want to put a record out, like to give you some money, would you be part of that system? If someone was to approach me now mm -hmm. with that offer, Mm -hmm. I'd say, let me see the contract. Yeah, fair enough. Let me see the terms and conditions, <laughs> because that's where all the action is. Most art, you know, musicians <laughs> are very young, very naive, just are so excited that someone likes their music, sign anything. Mm. And then there's years of litigation, regret, blah, mm. blah. I've heard the stories. Mm. Just going back, Tony, mm. to what you said about you put it on social media. Mm. 
I mean, already it's like, well, social media is owned by capitalism. True, true. So you, th you think it's just open to everyone, but no, there's an algorithm that decides we'll show that mm. or we won't. So you've still got the issue of there's an arbiter somewhere else deciding. So the only way you can actually get round it is to put up your your own exhibition, mm -hmm. uh, incidental, which is why I'm putting the happening on in Wakefield at the Red Shed. Just do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Invite like-minded people mm -hmm. and share the ideas that you've come up with. Mm -hmm. And then you get a genuine, authentic response from people. And I, I think actually that ultimately what I'm really angry about is the lack of emotion when I go to an art gallery. There's nothing there for me. Nothing. There's nothing to move me. We were discussing earlier about the cancel culture. Mm. Mm. If anybody does have anything interesting to say, or contra controversial, it's usually labelled, then it's like, ooh, not sure we... Ooh, no, we'd best not do that. We're a public-funded body. We're not re allowed to have that kind of ID. So immediately... You can, well, where's the interesting stuff? Where are the challenging arguments? The ideas of, um, you know, how should, how should we live? Where are the new ideas? There aren't any. And when we look at society and the way it's going, the globalisation, the, mm. the hierarchical, patriarchal, right wing now, uh, everything's going the same way. There's no alternative. It's not like, well, I'll go and live in such and such a place because it's completely different culture there. You can't do it. And we're getting fewer, fewer ideas. And traditionally, art used to be the area where people would express revolutionary ideas. So, you know, during the uh, the First World War, you got the Dardais and uh, as a reaction to the madness that was, that was going on. Whereas now... Where are they? Where are the artists and the poets who were... I mean, I'm going to touch on the, the Gaza thing, mm. right? Because it's it's current, it's topical. Even mentioning it, there was like this... Should I mention Gaza? Because immediately it's become politicised through... I mean, everything is political, mm. but it's become weaponised. Sorry, that's it's been weaponised. That you can't even discuss it. So... But I have seen some artworks where the art, some cartoonists or whatever, have created cartoons. I thought, that is powerful. That is a powerful piece of artwork. Uh, so, but that that aside, there doesn't seem to be any. There's no artist going, is this how we really want to live? Is this... So why are you putting on the happening? You're putting on an event. And exactly, why, why do it? It's the exact same thing as why I still play guitar. Hmm. The this analog piece of equipment or I thought let's put happening on uh, so I could try out these wacky ideas that I've got mm. that in a way criticize the existing paradigm model of the mm. art world so when people come to the the happening the whole the whole idea is to uh, challenge the expected way that an audience is supposed to behave with performers Typically, you get a compare, they announce, blah, blah, performance, they end, applause, blah, and next one. It's like, yeah, we, we, we've seen that, we've done that. So at the happening, there's no compare. Things just happen. And there's no expectation of the audience. They Whether they want to applause or get involved or comment, there's no, there's no role for them. They can do what they like at the happening. Uh, so that's that's... That's what that's what excites me about the idea. I'm looking forward to coming to it, um, but you know, happenings like that have been happening for uh, for decades. Uh, you know, there's the sixties, fifties. A lot of them wouldn't happen. You know, yours is happening inside a venue. You picked a venue, whereas you could have done it in the streets. You could have done it in the middle of a roundabout. You could have done it on a boat floating down the river there. Mm -hmm. So you've you've already gone into some kind of conventions, there's an audience coming, you've invited an audience, you've already started marketing it, you kind of create something and you have to, or you've had to rely on the norms of performance inside a venue with an audience, with the posters and stuff like that. So the question is why? If it's a, if it's a it, reaction against that, why are you using all those tropes to deliver it? 
you have to work within the system that exists. Right. So, to, like you mentioned on social media, mm. it's like you know, because so, like, mm. that's all there is. To be fair, the the best response we've had is when we've spoken to people personally, people mm-hmm. like yourself that we know, who go, "No, oh, that sounds really interesting." I say, "Yeah, no, come on." So I don't really uh, have much hope of the the advertising of it because you know the red shed is going to only hold so many people. Mm-hmm. So, it, but if people attend it that we know and it fires their imagination and then they talk about it, then okay. Let's get more ambitious. Let's do another one. Let's do it during the summer in the blah, whatever. Change the venue, or is there a venue, etc., mm. etc. Et mm. So then we can work that way. So that's you have to start from somewhere, mm. Mm. and so you have to work with what you've got, and that th- these tools are available: social media, the recording, the video. Mm. So it's like okay, we'll, we'll use that. But ultimately, it's about reconnecting with humanity. This is just technology, and in fact, it's a barrier. Mm between people, which is how capitalism thrives. It it wants isolated people to be unhappy so that they buy stuff that they don't need. Mm. So all these tools that we, we say we enjoy using, it's still a barrier. You know, if we were sat around a campfire telling stories, that would be the best experience. Mm. Because there's thousands of years of history of that. So... It's about reconnecting with what is human, the human emotions. So my response is that I think all that still exists because you're doing it. Uh, there's thousands, millions of artists doing just that because they enjoy it. It means something to them. Well, I think we're both. What we're, we're agreeing is it's, it's this it's this money making world that has always been there. Whenever you see somebody being creative, someone else will go, "I can make money out of that." It's exploitation. Mm. Is what we're talking about. Mm. But I wouldn't say that all art is dead and all art is unnecessary because you're doing it and I'm doing it and lots of people I know and care about are doing it. I don't think it's run out of ideas, otherwise you wouldn't be doing the happening. I think the art world is quite narrow-minded, but that's because they need to ship it and sell it to somewhere else. That's their business, it's not mine. Um, Would I want to be part of it? I have no idea, it's never going to happen, so I don't really lose any sleep over it. I think you just get up and make art and that's okay. So I think that's kind of, my response to all that is that I think the art in all its many forms is incredibly exciting, always will be, because human beings are incredibly exciting and always will be, and be challenging and be difficult. And same with the nature of the, the world we live in, it's always going to be challenging, it's always going to be difficult. Our responses will always change. So technology, you know, AI actually has freed up, I think, the artists. I feel sorry for illustrators who have got that level of skill, who spent years perfecting how to illustrate, and now they've found that their jobs have been overtaken by anybody who can type the right sequence of numbers and words into a computer. I do feel sorry for them. But actually, it feels, feeds up the artists to not to worry too much about that the, the detail of stuff. AI will never be able to generate the ideas. The advent of AI might actually be the catalyst that starts the revolution about getting people to think, well, hang on, it's a completely new landscape now then. We can do what the hell we like. How do we want to live? By the way, a disclaimer, uh, I have applied for a, a cultural grant for, to fund that happening. Good. I don't know what they're getting on. But, you know, the tool is there. So I thought, well, I'll try and access it. But even though I'm going to bite the hand that feeds me if they decide to give me one. But it's your hand because you funded, culture grants are funded by your right. money. So yeah. it's your money. You are the arbiter of taste. You said, I want to do this with my money. And there's a big panel that there's not enough money to fund everything, so not everybody will get funded. Sadly, we live in that kind of world. But a lot of them will. Um, And so that's exciting. So you are the person that decides where the money gets spent because you said, I want public funding to go on this, which is what I'm doing. So that's good. So good luck with that. I think, I think, hopefully, I I hope they will because I think it's a lovely idea. And so that's quite, that's, kind of a heartwarming thing, isn't it? You can have these ideas. You can go to a public funded body and say, fund my art. I think that's such a great <laughs> note to finish on, Tony, because it's optimistic <laughs> and it's so sorely lacking in the world. I want to thank you for your time, Tony, for coming along and debating art with me. Good luck with uh, your future projects and hopefully we can work together at happening, perhaps. Thank you. I enjoyed and... it very much and I'll be there at the very first happening. Great.